Good morning and welcome to our morning walk with the Apostles for Thursday, July the 8th, 2021. Certainly good to be with you this morning. I hope that your day has gotten off to a wonderful start. It's a beautiful day here in Hereford. Chances of rain, I think, have gone for a while, which is in a way a blessing because we've had quite a bit in the last couple of weeks. We're going to get started as usual with a prayer and then we'll get into our walk this morning as we continue looking and surveying the book of Romans. Let's bow together. Gracious and loving Father, we come into your presence as your children. We come thanking you and in gratitude for all that you do for us in our lives. You provide so many wonderful blessings. In fact, all blessings, everything comes from you. We just are so grateful and we want to never forget that you are the source of all good and perfect gifts. We thank you, Father, this morning for the new day that lies before us. And we pray that, Father, as we go through this day, that we will be on the lookout for opportunities to serve and to do your will. We pray, Father, that you'd always uh, give us the wisdom and the strength to see those opportunities and to take advantage of them. Father, what a blessing it is to be your children, to be adopted into your family. What a blessing it is that we're able to read and to know more about that as Paul is by inspiration written about it in Romans. Bless us in our time together this morning as we look at your word. Help us as we always seek to do your will. We thank you for Jesus, for his sacrifice, and we thank you for your word. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, this morning we come to Romans 8. Romans 8 begins with a continuation of the material of chapter 7, which is just closed on the note that there is deliverance through Jesus Christ from the wretched state the body is in because of the law of sin which is in my members in uh, chapter 7 verse 23b. We're also in a wretched state due to the constant temptation that we are under and the fact that we all sooner or later give in to that temptation and sin. But since now a real deliverance through Christ is possible, we can honestly say with verse 1 of chapter 8 that, quote, Therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. A further elaboration of this thought comes in verse 2, where Paul says, quote, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. End quote. We are continuing, therefore, consideration of the concept of the place of law and the Christian's relation to it. Particularly here, we get a clear sense of freedom from a certain type of law. We are free from the law of sin and death, which is that tendency that constantly dwells in our members through the which Satan tempts us to sin. The Christian system and salvation in Christ give us freedom from this law. Whatever this law of sin and death is, it is something that is clearly not good. But it can be completely overcome through Christ. The, quote, law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, end quote, may be interpreted as the principle of becoming united with Christ and saved by him. 
This is something greatly to be desired, desired as we all recognize. Clearly, there is victory in and through Christ in comparison to the spiritual defeat necessary under any other religious system. This law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus refers to the whole Christian system. In verse 3, we read, quote, For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, end quote, clearly refers to the law of Moses. It emphasizes the weakness of any legal system which is dependent upon human merit rather than upon the merit of Christ and his blood atonement. The fact that the law of Moses was weak is, of course, because of the flesh. No human lives a perfect enough life not to need a Savior, whatever sort of legal system he might be living under. Thus, without Christ, defeat is inevitable. But with Christ, victory can be certain. The way that God gave us hope of ultimate victory was in sending His own Son. Let's go back and read all of verse 3. Romans chapter 8, verse 3, Paul says, For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did, sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and as a sin offering, or excuse me, as an offering for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. Or he overcame its power and its consequences. The expression in verse 4a, so that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, means the purpose or goal could never be realized under that type of program alone. Thus, in Christ, we do have the victory that the law of Moses pointed toward and hoped for, but which was impossible under that kind of system, or any kind of legal system. The people for whom such victory is brought to fulfillment are those who are united with Christ spiritually. They are described in verse 4b as those, quote, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit, end quote. Now, to walk in this connection means simply to live or to conduct oneself. According to the flesh, and according to the Spirit, mean walking in harmony with each of these programs, sin or righteousness, respectively. The idea of the Christian life as a walk is not infrequent in the New Testament. In verse 5, quote, For those who live according to the flesh set their mind on the things of the flesh, end quote. This means that those who are living in harmony with fleshly desires and sin and unrighteousness give attention to or show a primary interest in such things. On the contrary, those who live according to the Spirit give attention to or show real interest in spiritual matters. Verse 6 expands on this thought, quote, For the mind set on the flesh is death, but the mind set on the spirit is life and peace. 
And then in verses 7 and 8, Paul continues to elaborate on the point. Quote, Because the mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. End quote. Now this mindset on the flesh is hostile to God because as long as it, as it maintains the attitude of interest in fleshly and worldly and non-spiritual things, it is absolutely contrary to God's purposes for the human being. It does not submit to the law of God in that it chooses not to do so. It is indeed obligated to God's will and God's law, but it does not choose to submit itself to God's law. Consequently, as long as it so chooses, it cannot be submissive to God and cannot be pleasing to God. Now verse 9a, speaking about the spiritual group, notes, however, you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. Christians who have come into Christ and have left the world and the fleshly things of the world and have been reborn as new creatures in Christ, are not in the flesh, quote-unquote. They are not living a life after the flesh. Rather, the Holy Spirit has been given to dwell in them as individuals. Now this thought refers us back to chapter 5, where Paul discussed the indwelling Spirit and elaborated the principle of the Holy Spirit personally dwelling in the individual. Verse 9b, back here in chapter 8, closes with the expression, quote, But if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. In whatever sense the Spirit dwells in the Christian, if he is not present in that capacity, the person is not really a Christian. When we speak of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, there is always the question of what the indwelling Spirit does. There are numerous works that the Spirit does in our lives which are mentioned in the pages of the New Testament, but possibly he does even more work for us as Christians in his indwelling capacity than is even described or discussed in, these, in the passages that consider that point. In verses 10 through 13 of Romans 8, we have some specific things mentioned what, which the Spirit does. Note verse 11, where Paul says, quote, But if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. Now this means that the ultimate resurrection of the body of the individual Christian to which we all look forward will be brought about through the Spirit. Now, we do not know how this happens specifically through His indwelling capacity, but in this context it appears to be the Spirit in the same sense that He dwells in us. In verses 12 and 13, Paul says, quote, So then, brethren, we are under obligation, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you are living according to the flesh, 
you must die. But if by the Spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Now, this means that the Spirit helps us in some way in overcoming our sinful deeds and actions. This is one of the points where this chapter gives us such wonderful hope and assurance. The fact is that the Spirit is helpful to us providentially, or in some way, such as the indwelling Spirit, to help us overcome and rise above our sinful tendencies. Now this is not to mean that we are forced to ab abstain from sinful deeds. We know from the general teachings of the scripture that every sin is ultimately based upon our own choice or our decision. And that, of course, we do have the final responsibility for our deeds and actions. But we are here taught that there is help, which, is, which the indwelling Spirit gives us toward living free from sin. That is very strengthening to our faith, to be able to believe this and to depend upon it and to cooperate with it. To cooperate with the indwelling Spirit, of course, means that we cooperate with His revelation. That we learn from the book of God, the Bible, which the Spirit Himself has already written by inspiring its human authors. What we need to do to live a godly life. We thus cooperate with his own decisions and teachings and plans for us. But when we make this effort of faith, the Spirit gives us benefits and blessings. In connection with our temptations and sins, we are promised that God, quote, will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, end quote, but that, quote, with the temptation will provide the way of escape also, so that you will be able to endure it. Now that's 1 Corinthians 10, verse 13. This tells us that God is conscious, conscious of our every sin, our spiritual need, and he certainly supplies help. This further means that the Christian who has the indwelling spirit has certain spiritual benefits and spiritual blessings that are not available to the non-Christian. There is providential aid which gives us hope and assurance. And this signifies that there is great value in being a child of God and being accepted by the Father as one of his children. Now let's go back to verse 10. Verse 10a reads, quote, If Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, End quote. This refers to our spiritual death to sin that was discussed in chapter 6. When we become Christians, we were, quote, crucified with Christ, end quote. Therefore, the body is dead, but the spirit is alive because of righteousness. We have been born anew and have become new creatures spiritually, through Christ and through his righteousness or his merit, which was credited to us. Now we are alive in Christ. 
even though our body has been crucified. Again, verse 11a observes, But if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. Now understand, this is a first-class conditional sentence. The word if may be translated, therefore, as since. But since the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead, that is the Father, will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. End quote. An important point in verse 11 is that God surely raised Jesus from the dead and he will surely raise us from the dead at our resurrection and will use the Holy Spirit in doing so. Well, tomorrow we're going to continue to survey Romans chapter 8 as we consider uh, verses 12 through uh, 17, where Paul discusses our adoption and our sonship. Hope you can be with me then. Let's close this morning's morning walk with a word of prayer. Father, we're so grateful to be able to read about your provision for the Spirit in our lives. And while we don't understand everything that that He does, we are just so grateful that He dwells within us, that He assists us in ways that, that we are not aware of, and sometimes even I think that we're not uh, anticipating. But Father, we're grateful, for we know that it is through His instruction and His teaching in the Word that He has given in our maturing, in our faith, in our growing, in our strength, in our knowledge, as those things influence our decisions and help us to choose to resist temptation and to make the godly right choices and go in the way that we you would have us to. He's working in us. And that's your will for us. And we're grateful. Help us to be sensitive to listening to the Spirit as he speaks through your word and guides us there. We pray this all in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, I hope that your Thursday is a great one. Go out and make it that way. Lord willing, we'll be back tomorrow at 10 o'clock to continue a morning walk with the apostles.